I'm Patty Walsh. I'm an assistant clinical professor at UCLA. Um, I uh, direct our neuropsychology um, center um, as well as direct the clinical uh, functional MRI um, program that we have that maps um, things such as language and motor and sensory function for neurosurgery. Um, so I do a lot of that as well as a lot of like mapping in surgery or grid mapping, bedside, things like that. Um, so the first thing I want to, so I have a lot of different hats I wear. I wear a researcher hat, I wear a clinician hat, and I first wanted to start with my clinician hat um, because this is a question that I often get in rounds. <laughs> and they say, well, Patty, the patient's only X years old, two years old, four years old, 10 years old, so language will be okay, right? Right? Um, and I think this is the hardest question for me to answer, and I, you might get an eye roll from me sometimes when you ask me this, because we don't really know at this point at what age it's okay to interfere with language within a hemisphere, okay? And I think that's really one of the biggest things that I think is missing from all the literature. So let me tell you a little bit about language. You've heard a little bit about this um, thus far, um, but I'll go into it a little bit more. I also took Monica's um, rule of no citations to heart, so there's no citations in here, but everything is actually from the literature. Um, in general, language is in the left hemisphere of the brain, the left side of the brain, okay? This is true for the majority of right-handers. It's actually true for the majority of left-handers as well, okay? But if you are left-handed, like myself, you have a slightly larger chance of having language in the right hemisphere or language in both hemispheres or part of language in one and part of language in the other, okay? Um, and as we mentioned earlier in the reading talk, the, the right hemisphere is not silent, right? It also does a lot of things related to language, things like prosody and understanding sarcasm, metaphors, things like that, more complicated kind of hierarchical social use of language. Um, there are some exceptions to the left-sided rule though, okay? First of all, one of them is something like a stroke or a large lesion that occurs in utero okay, or at birth, okay? In newborns or in early childhood, so like less than one, you, when you give, when you do fMRI tasks on um, babies, you see language represented in a very broad network in the brain and in general it's in both hemispheres, fairly, fairly well distributed, okay? As you get older and you start to develop more language, you actually start to specialize that usually and to solidify it into one hemisphere. And that's again once you have two working hemispheres, okay? So at birth, newborns aren't really predisposed to have it necessarily in one hemisphere or the other. So if you have a stroke in one hemisphere, it tends to slip very nicely into the other hemisphere. Humans are a verbal species. We need language to communicate with each other and language will take hold wherever it can and it's gonna do that at the sacrifice sometimes of other things. Like it's like, yeah, you don't really need visual, you don't need to be able to put puzzles together, but you need to speak to other humans, okay? The other thing that can um, be an exception to the left-sided rule is epilepsy in childhood. And this is actually regardless of what age seizures started. If they started in childhood, you can have more um, propensity towards atypical representation of language, meaning language in either right hemisphere or both hemispheres. Okay, man, usually I have slides to look at, now I have to look at them up here, okay. So the current research, how plastic is the brain for language at this point, okay? Studies vary on how many patients there are, okay? And I think this is a really big thing, and again, I think we've all said this over the course of the whole day, is that most of our studies do not have enough patients in them to really make a lot of sense of things. There are some bigger studies that have been mentioned, um, such as one of the largest studies um, that looked at a large sample of children with hemispherectomy, um, where 70% had satisfactorily spoken language, and that's defined as more than two or three word phrases. So they can say a few phrases, maybe, or have near normal language. Um, but only 42% of those children older than six had good reading skills, okay? So again, there's some variability there. Um, there's a number of case studies in language for hemispherectomy. Um, but, um, and some of them show evidence for recovery of language. I don't really like recovery. I like, 
um, compensation or ability to use language, but little is known about how language was organized before they went to surgery. And I think this is a really big key for me, is that we don't really know if it's actually reorganization. If you started with language in the right hemisphere, we do a left hemispherectomy and you're like, oh, we got language. Well, what, maybe it was ex there in the first place the whole time. Like Luke said, you know, you found language in both hemispheres. That's great because they did do a preoperative fMRI. But most of the studies that are out there don't have preoperative fMRI to show this. So the assumption is, look, language can move, but we really don't know if it's actually moving or if it just existed in the right hemisphere in the first place. Um, a lot of these case studies will slip in at the end, like, oh, and also the patient's a little ambidextrous, a little left-handed, or they have left-handedness in the family, and it's like, oh, okay. Um, but again, just having childhood epilepsy in the first place automatically increases your chance of having this atypicality, okay? So let's talk about specific parts of language, okay? In patients, so let's talk about left hemispherectomy. Typically, um, if you do have language in the left hemisphere, you get very frank aphasia or lack of speech at, right after surgery. That will happen and it is a complete and total loss initially. Um, the comprehension of speech is something that seems to recover the best of all the primary language functions at this point. It may be because a lot of studies show that comprehension, or what we call Wernicke's area, often tends to have a little bit of bilateral representation or representation in both sides of the brain for most people. And especially if you had childhood epilepsy, it may tend to hang in both hemispheres. Um, that may be why it recovers the best. It also has a broader representation. So while Broca's area, or the area that does kind of the speaking part of speech, has a very specific area of the brain, Wernicke's tends to be a little bit more broad in its representation. Um, in terms of expressive language or speaking, it has a little bit of a mixed result. There's a little bit of a better recovery in your ability to repeat things, um, but naming, so saying, that's a table, that's a chair, that's a phone, um, you know, that's a lady, whatever. That actually tends to be pretty um, significantly impaired in most people. Um, complex grammar is another thing. Um, it's better, you'll tend to develop more complex grammar if you had the hemispherectomy earlier in the period of language development than if you had it later on, okay? In terms of reading, we kind of already talked about this a little bit. Um, it's a little bit mixed, but again, poorer than comprehension and speaking. I think reading is very complicated. You do reading from a lot of places in your brain, okay? We're also not made to read as a species. We taught ourselves how to read, and we use a whole different system just to read. Um, the majority of patients who've had a hemispherectomy in the left hemisphere are below grade level or only reading sight words. And again, as we talked about in terms of the visual cortex, you actually do have a representation in the visual kind of associative area for word forms, right? And so you actually will read words like cat, you don't read it like cat, right? Once you know it, you just see it and it becomes an object. So no longer is it a word that you're phonetically reading. So a lot of times the sight words you're not actually reading in terms of kind of like phonetic reading. You just know a bunch of pictures, and they happen to have letters in them. Um, up to 18% of kids who have left hemispherectomy cannot read. Um, it also depends on whether language was delayed before surgery or not. The kids who tend to recover reading better um, are the kids who did not have language delay before surgery. Okay. Okay. A lot of times recovery actually depends on the reason for the hemispherectomy or the actual diagnosis itself. This actually seems to be more important in terms of language than age at surgery, okay? So for instance, kids with hemimegalencephaly in general do worse with language recovery. Again, these are kids that tend to have these surgeries very early in life, okay? Um, in one study, about 66% of kids had little to no language after five years after surgery. Um, and this is true even in patients who have right hemispherectomy, okay? So it does not seem to matter which hemisphere you do the resection is, the language tends to have more difficulty in hemimegalencephaly. It also may somewhat be related to the other remaining hemisphere not necessarily being normal itself, okay? There may be disruption in that hemisphere as well. In terms of full um, hemisphere cortical dysplasia, where you do have a large cortical dysplasia where you will do a hemispherectomy, they tend to do a bit better 
In one study, 45% had near normal language. Um, but they also tend to have language difficulty when the right side of the brain is involved as well. So again, um, it doesn't, it may not necessarily be that it's the dominant hemisphere that can cause some language disruption. In terms of Rasmussen's, the res results are mixed for a bit better. Again, in patients that are younger, um, language may be near normal um, after resection. And a stroke at birth, these kids have tend to do the best in terms of reorganizing language or just, I don't even say reorganizing, they just develop language in the hemisphere that's used, usable. Um, and again, they can use that hemisphere right from the start. Um, and again, if you have a stroke in infancy or um, perinatal right around birth, that predicts, predicts better language function than if you have a stroke later in childhood. If you have a stroke once language is kind of in its own place, that tends to cause a lot more difficulty. Um, so factors that predict better language in all hemispherectomy patients are shorter length of illness, seizure control after surgery, again, seizure freedom, um, and the developmental level before the illness occurred. Okay, so the more typically developing you are, the better in general your cognitive outcome, but in particular language. Um, so I just wanted to show you, because I want to talk a little bit now about um, kind of within a hemisphere, kind of like singular lobe or multi-lobe resection. Um, so within a hemisphere, there's a number of different areas of the brain that um, oh, here's, there we go, have different uh, responsibility for language. Okay, we kind of showed this. I think somebody else showed some a slide like this. This is kind of area for more comprehension, reading, naming things, speaking, saying stuff. This part's kind of an associative area that allows you to do the motor planning of speech. And all the areas are connected as well. So language works as a system. It's not just this blob and that blob and that part of the brain doing things. Um, I always say language um, is a homebody, okay? Once it finds its little nook and cranny in your brain, it really likes to stay there until you force it out. Okay, it gets very cozy and warm. Um, it tends not to reorganize within one side of the brain, okay? So it's not like you can take the part of the frontal lobe that's just responsible for speech and expect it to just develop somewhere else within that frontal lobe. That doesn't happen at all, okay? Um, it would have to use the other side if it wants to recover any function, okay? And there's a little wiggle room within the one side, but it's limited. Um, the older you get and the more established language becomes within its hemisphere, the less space it tends to take up. So again, you start with these broad language networks as an infant and they tend, they really get refined as you get older, okay? Um, and you have a greater chance of having, uh, I talked about that, of comprehension on both sides, okay? So age of surgery for these types of lobular in, um, resections, singular lobe resections, age becomes a factor, okay? Because once it's specialized within that hemisphere, if you do disrupt it, it is harder to move it. Um, particularly if you do do functional MRI ahead of time, and it is solidly only in one hemisphere, it is much harder to move it to the other hemisphere at that point, okay? This is why if you have a stroke later in life or you have a brain tumor that affects um, and you're 60 years old, it's not, there's not a lot of chance you have of moving Broca's to the other hemisphere, okay? So earlier surgery does provide more chance for movement. And obviously the less lobes involved, the better outcome you have for both language and reading. Okay, so in terms of take home points, um, language com outcomes in hemispherectomy tend to relate more to disease type than other factors like age of surgery. Certain aspects of language recover better than others, um, particular comprehension. And language wants to say where it is once it's set up shop. Okay, once it's there, it doesn't really like to move, okay? Um, and it's harder to move the part of the brain that does speaking, so one in the, the part in the frontal lobe, than it is to do the part that does understanding or comprehension, okay? The primary areas, these are things like basic understanding and speaking, may be more likely to recover at least some function than ones that hold kind of fancier functions. So you, again, you tend to have more difficulty with things like reading or complicated grammar or things like that or even pragmatics, kind of social aspects of speech in terms of recovery of that, then you might get some words out or some understanding comprehension, okay? Um, and the effects of language recovery likely depend on how the brain is organized before surgery, okay? So at what age is it okay to do surgery then? Okay, well again, we don't really know. 
my biggest pet peeve in the literature right now is that a lot of times we don't know how language is organized beforehand. So we can't really say anything about plasticity, so to speak, or recovery unless we know what it looked like at the beginning, okay? Um, so it's really important that we have studies that look at the brain before surgery and after surgery and see, because we do want to see if language is reorganizing. It's good to know at what age can that happen, at what kind of disease can that happen, and what type of surgery can that happen. I think that's a really important question, and we don't really know that at this point. Um, again, diagnosis is clearly a factor. I think it would be really helpful to study these diagnoses separately, just to see how language is developing in these types of kids, because they're very different. Um, there's also very limited long-term long outcome data, right? So initially, usually there's data like six months, two years, maybe five years, but really there's nothing down the line. So like what happens after nine or ten years? Is there any chance of developing language at that point? There's a no long-term outcome data in hemimegalencephaly, right? We don't know what happens to these kids. Do they, are they able to develop any language if they don't have any, okay? Um, and again, really the numbers need to come up a little bit. If we could get together groups of um, kids who've had hemispherectomy, who have hemimegalencephaly, things like that, I think it would be really useful in helping us to determine what's going on in the brain. Okay? That's it. <laughs>